Okay, so welcome back from your final break, everybody. Um, this is our penultimate session of uh, Calc 23. So I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Massengale, and they're going to be talking to us about LRM, queer theory, and Marxism in conceptual engineering. I'll, I'll let you introduce it, Chris. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've had a long day, and you're bright and fresh and early over there. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, don't worry. It's a, it's a, it's it's quite wordy actually. Um, so yeah, my name my name is Chris. Um, uh, good morning to everyone in uh, the U.S. Good afternoon to everyone in the U.K. and uh, good evening to everyone elsewhere. Um, I'm so very excited to be here. Um, I've had to duck in and out of sessions uh, due to the difference in time zones and because I've fallen ill over the past few days. So also excuse any coughing, any any weird voice things, but. Um, while I made a valiant effort to wake up in time for the first presentations, um, I will be watching some of the recordings afterwards, which is something I'm very excited about. Um, and I'm really thankful to have been invited to share my work here with you all at Calc. Um, this is just a really amazing opportunity to hear from other professionals um, engaged in the current discourse surrounding critical librarianship. Um, and it feels more important than ever for us to come together to discuss these topics. Um, especially considering the current political climate in the US um, where the, the, the need for intervention has never been more dire. Um, I, uh, I guess I'll introduce myself um, a little bit uh, and I'll introduce my, my presentation. Um, so today I will be presenting an essay I wrote for Dr. Deborah Lee's um, cataloging and classification module at UCL in 2021. And um, in contrast to previous sessions, um, I will be reading this paper semi-verbatim, so please bear with me. It's um, pretty wordy. I'm not the most eloquent speaker, but if you wish to read the essay in full um, afterwards, I can arrange to send you a copy. And um, also, as I'm taking a more formal approach, uh, a little background on myself. Um, I was born and raised in Northwest Arkansas. I uh, graduated from the University of Arkansas in 2019 with a degree in uh, art history and a minor in medieval and Renaissance studies. And then in 2021, I came to UCL and um, finished up my master's in library and information studies in 2022. Um, and there I wrote a dissertation on queer narratives and um, the dissemination of allegorical queer knowledge in um, early Christian and medieval texts. And my research interests primarily lie in um, the exploration of reconstructing lost trans histories uh, through modern philosophical thought and uh, critical theory. Um, so although I have a very much a, a rare book sort of historical bibliography uh, background, um, I uh, am really excited to present this paper today because it was one of my favorite that I wrote um, in grad school. Um, and a little more about myself. Uh, I worked at uh, the University of Library, or no, the University of Arkansas Special Collections, the London Library, and the Lambeth Palace Library uh, with a stint in Japan and teaching English uh, in between. Um, so I've, I've kind of, I've been around the block, I suppose. Um, and uh, I also want to note, it, it's important to, to tell you that this essay was written within the parameters of a final assessment, again, in 2021. Um, it's not an exhaustive discussion on the topic. And although I've made several amendments to outdated information, um, this, this field um, you know, is advancing so rapidly and um, its <laughs> topics are constantly developing. And um, there are most certainly gaps in uh, literature um, which I recognize, and I'm hoping to rectify an upcoming research. Um, so this work is a bit of a product of its time, um, but I feel that it's still relevant to discuss, uh, even if uh, antiquated cataloging guidelines, um, even if they are antiquated, it's 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 best to situate our understanding of uh, of the present uh, in our previous practices, um, and. Uh, just as well, a warning, this is a theory heavy essay. Um, there's a lot to say in 30 minutes, um, but I do have an ex extensive list of sources on the final slides, um, which should be posted on the Calc website um, if you would like to peruse those. And um, 
should there be time, if you would like to post questions or comments in the chat, um, feel free and I'll address them if I can. And just as well, you are welcome to shoot me an email, um, which is on the screen right now. Um, if you'd like a copy of specific references and quotes used throughout the essay, or if you would like to read it in full. Um, but some of the wonderful presenters um, from the past two days have already covered some of these topics in one way or another and with great insight. And hopefully those sessions will have provided some context for what I will be speaking about today. Um, I would like to issue just a quick and, and brief trigger warning for um, broad discussions of transphobia, such as um, dead naming, et cetera, anything in that vein. So if you find yourself uncomfortable at any point, please take care of yourself, click out, I don't mind. Um, but there shouldn't be anything too egregious. Um, and I would also like to note that I'm uh, approaching this work from the perspective of a trans person. Um, I'm a non-binary trans masculine person and I use they, them pronouns. Um, and really this is a, a, feels like such a safe space to discuss issues of queerness and transness in um, libraries. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, so with that, uh, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and stop my video because as I said, I'm a bit under the weather. I, you, you all don't need to, to, to see this, but um, let's get started. So with a brief look at the agenda, um, I'm going to go through my introduction, um, a brief overview of terminology um, related to queer theory and queerness. Um, I'm going to cover theoretical frameworks um, if LRM, um, RDA, Mark 21, um, for which descriptions will be given within the essay, um, we will uh, deep dive into the way that gender is treated in, um, in all of these um, mechanisms. Uh, we will be discussing the complexities of language and describing queerness, and then we will get into the theory and critical intervention in cataloging um, meat of the essay. Um, and then I'll have some final thoughts and hopefully, again, time for questions and comments. So dissemination of personal bias is inevitable when the role of the cataloger begins to resemble that of a biographer and rectifying evidence of this bias begins in our theoretical frameworks. To whom should we be granting the authority of negotiating gender and identity within the bibli bibliographic universe? I wish to advocate for critical engagement with bibliographic tools and guidelines for the purposes of self-identification, community intervention, and resistance against hegemonic manifestations of authority control. Furthermore, I would like to suggest that the relationship between the entities RES and NOMEN within the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions Library Reference Model, hereafter IFLA LRM or simply LRM, as a progressive model of authority control within the bibliographic universe with respect to chronicling personal information about gender diverse authors. Through an exploration of the several ways in which LRM, Mark 21, and resource description and access, hereafter RDA, handle gender, I will consider alternatives to ethical dilemmas to cataloging and queerness, to cataloging, to cataloging queerness in line with the critical approaches taken by Amber Billy, Emily Jurbinski, and Kalani Adolfo, among others. More precisely, I'm interested in the correlation between Melissa Adler's assertion that when considering bibliographic control and queer theory, it is crucial for catalogers to reconcile with the, quote, impossibility of fairness in the present while imagining the possibility for a field of justice and equality in the future. Let us consider for a moment LRM as the lens through which we conceptualize cataloging ethics, queer theory as the lens through which we critique them, and Marxian praxis as the lens through which critical reflection is implemented. While the structural models may not yet be available to us, we can return to conceptual models to recontextualize the ways in which we approach recording gender variance in catalog records. For the purposes of this essay, I will be using terms such as gender variant and queer interchangeably to describe people who identify outside of, not at all, or at odds with gender binarism as it, as it is understood within a heteronormative context. I will also utilize this language to describe individuals who align themselves with binary, with binary gender categories, such as man or woman, 
but in a manner incongruent with the gender they were assigned at birth, who were more commonly referred to as being transgender or simply trans. It is important to note that many of the issues I will discuss affect anyone who is perceived to commit gender transgressions, such as, to cite but a few examples, those who are intersex or non-binary, in addition to individuals who are otherwise gender non-conforming in their performance of gender and sexuality based on the, quote, binary distinctions as arbitrarily determined and denned by those with social power. Queer theory then refers to the critical theory in which normative expectations at normative expressions of gender and sexuality are destabilized, subverted, and dismantled. It is concerned with the way in which queerness, quote, remains socially and culturally unintelligible underneath the threshold of re representability within the power structures that sustain Western society. As an entity relationship model, created to navigate the bibliographic universe, the primary goal of LRM introduced in 2017 is to, quote, make explicit general principles governing the logical structure of bibliographic information. It is my suggestion that LRM E9, the entity nomen, accommodates the concept of fluid identities and its potential for multiplicity. While, I, while our LRM E1, res, functions as an all-encompassing genderless superclass, Res can represent any entity in the universe of discourse and includes both material or physical things and concepts. It is a superclass of all other entities that are explicitly defined, as well as any other entities that are not specifically labeled. Res as a concept allows a person to be defined in terms as simple or as complex as they wish, redistributing the power of self-identification in a manner that favors gender agnosticism. In LRM, nomen is defined simply as an association between an entity and the designation that refers to it. The hierarchy of LRM with res positioned at the top and nomen as an outside variable recognizes the multi, multi <laughs> the multiple possibilities to queering identity. Functioning as appellations of one another, res and nomen are particularly advent advantageous tools to circumvent the representational pitfalls of identity categorization and authority control. In this way, LRM provides a ubiquitous language through which to conceptualize a relationship between people and their characteristics. The structure of an entity relationship model lends itself to the discussion of cataloging ethics and descriptive propriety when operating under the assumption that inter interference from socio-political agendas is a constant presence in our cataloging practices. There's no indication that omitting gender from, the bibli from bibliographic records disrupts the execution of LRM user tasks defined as find, identify, select, obtain, and, uh, and explore. While the attribute gender is existent in LRM when associated with LRM E7 person, unlike previous functional requirement models, it is left undefined, indicating that it is not required. The ambivalent stance LRM assumes on gender appears to serve little importance in the creation of metadata when alternative pathways of author identification exist. To mention but a few, Billy recommends authority records be reduced to characteristics of the author that are largely objective, such as works published, lifespan, field of activity, and occupation. The first two attributes listed alone should, in most cases, provide enough information to distinguish even between two authors producing works under the same name within the same discipline. Creation of bibliographic identities through nomen clusters which correlate to the same res, may be the first inclination for catalogers creating a name authority record on a single person who has authored works under multiple names. This simplifies the task of consolidating pseudonyms or alternative personas under a single res, but determining the appropriate course of action is far less intuitive as it, re as it relates to identity outside of a bibliographical context. It is important to note that within the ethos of the LGBT LGBTQ plus community to dead name someone, that is to refer to an, indiv an individual by a name, often by the name they were assigned at birth, with which they no longer identify, is a, respect is a disrespectful and potentially dangerous act. Catalog records leave authors who are not out 
which is a term commonly used to describe the visibility of someone as belonging to the LGBTQ plus community in society at large, leave these authors out in all areas of their life vulnerable to discrimination or acts of violence. Situating names and dead names within the context of the, of the author's bibliographic profile hinges on an individual's self-determination. There's no one fixed answer, but to err on the side of caution would be to catalog with compassion. Additionally, it is accepted within the scope of LRM that, quote, the cataloger may not know and has no need to know whether any of these nomens is a form of the person's real legal name or not. But this is problematized when cataloging practice fails to accommodate theory. RDA, a standard implemented by the Library of Congress in 2013, was designed to introduce coherence and structure to cataloging practices. It is difficult to conceptualize the experiences of gender variant people in relation to descriptive cataloging guidelines such as RDA, wherein, quote, gendered norms are maintained and reproduced in systems and structures, usually by people to whom binary gender is normal, natural, and obvious. Further, furthermore, Billy notes that RDA elements introduced for the purpose of particularizing catalog records have failed to cultivate a user experience in which perceived benefits to, met to, metadata, to metadata navigation justify violation of an author's privacy. Time and labor on behalf of the cataloger must be redirected into the pursuit of information regarding the author's identity, assuming often incorrectly that said information can be authentically reproduced or expressed in definite terms. As illustrated by the ill-famed RDA Rule 9.7 on recording gender, it is within the various interpretations of theoretical frameworks that ethical issues arise. At the advent of RDA Rule 9.7, the only options for recording gender were, were reduced to fe female, male, or unknown, erasing the existence of a significant portion of gender variant individuals from the catalog record altogether. Allowing for time span to be recorded alongside gender in Mark 21, using the dollar sign S and dollar sign T subfields or start period and end period respectively, failed to, rent, failed to remedy this issue as it assumes that gender identity follows a perceptible linear trajectory. Assigning a time span to issues of self-actualization requires a level of precision that I argue would be impossible to determine in a meaningful way. Despite the, despite the successful efforts of the PCC ad hoc task group to dispute and revise RDA 9.7 so that gender is no longer recorded as it part of a unique name string, issues with locality and catalogers judgment persist in recording information about gender. But I will say um, that since, since, the, since the composition of this essay, um, the new PCC ad hoc task group on recording gender in personal name authority records was successful in amending the recommendation for personal name authorities. And the new guidance now states that gender should not be recorded in the 375 field and that existing 375 fields should be deleted when editing a record for any other reason. And this, I, I feel like the change in this rule, just, just in the time that I have um, written this essay, uh, not only, shows that we're making great strides in cataloging ethics, but um, emphasizes just what was wrong with this line of thinking in the first place. So with name authority records, there are many issues of private, many issues with privacy. As of 2021, the Library of Congress Network Development and Mark Standards Office provided the following example for codifying transgenderism in the 375 field. As you can see on the screen, um, the advice was um, directed towards uh, recording information about a transgender author, um, which correctly stated that she was female. Um, but in terms of the timeline, um, there is a dubious date of 1972. And um, it was suggested that uh, to provide further context um, for this inconsistency between her, her previous name, her dead name, her current name, it was to um, provide her dead name, um, her date of birth, and then to notify 
the user that um, she had had a sex change operation and had taken a new name. But one fails to pinpoint the necessity of introducing the author's medical history to a catalog record. Such displays of entitlement to personal information regarding transgender individuals and their bodies at best lacks nuance and at worst borders on voyeur voyeurism. Moreover, this particular entry provokes questions about preferred and non-preferred names and the correlation between metadata functionality and ethical sacrifices. Because of the highly personal nature of the subject, a single solution cannot exist for the dilemma of names. Regardless, LRM user tasks should not have to come at the expense of personal privacy. Kelly J. Thompson suggests utilizing uniform resource identifiers or URIs um, and numerized author identification strings in order to create cohesive name authority records that do not rely on more explicit means of conveying relationships within the bibliographic universe. Similarly, Billy suggests a shift towards a linked data environment for identity management principles. For example, the dollar sign U subfield within the 375 field can be used to input the source of information about gender accessible electronically through a URI. And as, and as of 2020, one can use the dollar sign zero subfield to provide a system control number, standard identifier, or URI in order to specify the definition of a label applied to the 375 field. Similarly, the dollar sign one field allows for the input of a real world object URI in relation to the term. In the event that authors wish to, wish to self identify as queer, it is possible for the repeatable mark 37X fields 373 and 374 or field of activity and associated group respectively to describe aspects of the author's gender or sexuality which hold reasonable bibliographic significance on a basis of consent and inner community mediation when possible. Though I would contend that it is not the responsibility of catalogers to educate users on the specifics of gender identity, the option to redirect users who may be unfamiliar with terminology describing queer phenomena via integrated URIs could serve as a benefit for both parties when the preference is awarded to when preference is awarded to resources created by members of the LGBTQ plus community. The Homosaurus, a linked data vocabulary created as a resource for LGBTQ plus subject terms in the spirit of queer information activism is a particularly vi valuable resource in this area, even if collaborators of the Homosaurus, uh, such as Marika C4 and, C and KJ Rawson, acknowledge the futility in using subject term vocabularies to combat the intrinsic incompatibility of classification processes and queer vocabularies. They agree that, quote, much of the subcultural power of queer and trans language practice depends on the relative obscurity of the language. As soon as it becomes institutionalized, it loses power. And while I concur with the sentiment when Billy advises catalogers to, quote, describe people as they describe themselves, this path of recourse does not come without issue. First, the cataloger must sacrifice both time and effort, resources of perpetual scarcity and librarianship from the outset in pursuit of an autobiographical account from the subject, assuming this information is publicly available through manifest channels, such as an author's statement or on the author's verified social media. If this account is not so easily accessible, then the cataloger could attempt to source this information directly from the person in question. And we can, for the purposes of this exercise, disregard the implications of co contacting someone out of the blue to interrogate them about their gender identity. From there, the cataloger must assume that by eternalizing this means of self-identification in the authority record, that it is not subject to change unless they are willing to keep tabs on the developments of, in the lives of every individual for whom catalog records exist, undertaking re revisions is necessary and Consequently, trusting colleagues and institutions who import their records to do the same. Based on these factors, I believe Adolfo is fair in concluding that, quote, the level of training and amount of direct communication with the subjects of name authority records necessary to even approach ethically recording gender would be unsustainable. Nonetheless, instructions given by the Library of Congress Program for Cooperative Cataloging Policy Statements indicate that the catalogers judgment should be relied upon when describing a person's gender, preferring a controlled vocabulary such as the Library of Congress demographic group terms. And while, author, while others such as 
Ellen Greenblatt have argued that users should be able to find the information they need through the utilization of, quote, culturally sensitive terms, this does not alleviate the linguistic challenges surrounding queerness. Adhering to a controlled vocabulary is problematic in practice when much of the language used to describe gender variance has yet to stabilize. While this is ideal in theory, the reluctance of the Library of Congress to adopt the word queer, despite its connotative shift in the mainstream throughout the past two decades, illustrates this persistent issue in the implementation of con controlled vocabulary. That is, marginalized peoples are often forced to, for Lack of more, for lack of more appropriate alternatives, describe themselves using the derogatory language that is or was once used as a tactic of oppression. Thus, the absence of positive visibility in society results in the reappropriation of abusive vocabulary into self-identifying colloquialisms. When members of the LGBTQ plus community first began reappropriating the word queer in the 1980s, it was during a time when the term was used to shame and disparage individuals who diverged from social norms regarding gender and sexuality. And to this day, many people who would traditionally fall inside the definition of this term are uncomfortable with being referred to as such. This begs the question, how is one to determine which terminology will be appropriate to describe gender and sexuality 10 years from now when the queer lexicon is, at present, ensnared in a temperamental post-structuralist irreverence? It is at a theoretical crossroads that we approach impossible questions by returning to the structures that create impossible conditions. And it is here that I advocate for the viability of a queer Marxism within cataloging ethics. John J. Doherty explains that Marxism, that Marxian praxis, quote, refers to the process of applying theory through practice to develop more informed theory and practice, specifically as it relates to social change. He goes on to advocate for its, quote, obvious and particular relevance to librarianship in reference to the professional obligation of librarians as facilitators of intellectual freedom. It should be noted that many queer theorists, such as Sheila Baer, accuse Marxian ideology of being reductionist, obsolete, or of dubious compatibility with current discourse surrounding approaches to queer theory, insofar as the terminal message can become nothing more than everyone is queer, no, therefore no one is queer, let's move on. But if, if there are no straightforward answers to reconciling queerness and descriptive cataloging, then we must reflect on the origins of these ethical dilemmas, which are produced almost unfailingly in response to capitalist society's reliance on conflict and exploitation. Marxist praxis-based approaches build upon revealing and deposing structures of oppression rather than seeking to occupy a niche within them. That is, rather than attempting to fix the language that complicates describing queerness, it is more imperative to encourage a shift in users' interactions with the material and, crit and critical engagement with the guidelines which dictate best practice within the creation of catalog records. The insufficiency of controlled vocabularies and cataloging guidelines alongside guidance for information professionals to favor impartiality over critical intervention is complicit in relinquishing control of the narrative to the cultural mainstream, wherein entities and positions of power, as explained by Rosemary Hennessy, quote, set out to legitimize exclu excluded social groups while leaving the organization of social life unquestioned in fundamental ways. If we are to come to the conclusion that the categorization of identity is a reflection of capitalist socio-political realities, then the language surrounding queerness becomes a tool of assimilation, subject to commodification over explicit acceptance. And I should clarify that I'm not suggesting that there is no inherently queer vocabulary, but that the desire to assimilate identity into pre-existent structures of oppression serves only to facilitate said oppression. Returning to previous discussions, Adolfo's standpoint that, quote, RDA 9.7 continues the work of cisgender and Western hegemony by packing complex and personal gender identities into static, discrete, controlled vocabularies in combination with the exclusivity lent to RDA as a subscription-based service demonstrates how the intersectionality, intersectionality of these ideologies, in this instance, queer theory, Marxist praxis, Marxist praxis and cataloging ethics is of the most is of the is of the utmost relevance when considering to whom we are deferring and why when we codify certain rules and guidelines. And I realize I'm 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 running out of time here. I have a final um, I have a final concluding paragraph if that's all right. I'll yeah. conclude with my support. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you go, you go ahead. We've got another another minute or so. Perfect. 
So um, I'll conclude with my support for the following suggestion posited by Adler that, quote, the paradox we've identified with access to information cannot fully be resolved within existing discourses and structures. In the absence of viable alternatives, catalogers should turn to theoretical frameworks such as IFLA LRM in order to best articulate the relationship between authors, self-identification, and the level of granularity requisite for bibliographic clarity. True descriptive neutrality cannot be determined, let alone enforced, provided the existence of gender variant persons remains a contested political issue, caught in the throes of tacit and antagonistic techniques of minoritization, and policy that is explicitly, vocally, and violently in, in opposition to our existence. However, mitigating expectations in regards to the per personal information that is made accessible through bibliographic records is one way to confront ethical decisions in cataloging. This too could exist on a spectrum of self-identification and consent. Abstract models of, inter of interpretation lend themselves to describing queerness in a world that is still largely struggling to conceptualize its existence, let alone celebrate it. As a result, catalogers cannot on an individual basis prioritize information retrieval when they are beholden to rules of description that categorize gender variance as unintelligible in the Western cultural paradigm. There's a power in this, one that I argue should be redistributed to the lived experiences of individuals and the ways in which users and library professionals alike meet standards and guidelines with critical reception and in consultation with multidisciplinary theoretical frameworks. Crucially, this includes acknowledging the ways in which language and authority control betray symptoms of broader systemic control. To bow to exclusionary models in which we are not free to, but allowed to exist is to surrender and our implementation of cataloging ethics is but one location in which we as information professionals have the opportunity to promote queer self-agency in concrete and critical ways. Sorry, I've gone over time there, but thank you so much everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Chris. That was really interesting. Um, we don't have time for questions, unfortunately, um, but are you hanging around for a little while, Chris? Yeah, I'll be here for the rest of the afternoon. Okay, cool. So uh, can maybe address any questions within the chat? Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm thank going to pass you. on to our final speaker for today, uh, Rachel.